Hey guys, this is Joe Harper with Reform Truth Through Ministries. The topic of today's video is the case of Tom Chantry. Now, this is a different type of video than any other video I've ever done. Um, this is a video that's talking about a man who was found guilty in court for child molestation, and it's a story of of churches and an entire association of churches, at least the leadership, the main leadership of that association covering it up. And the reason why I've decided to do a video of something that's a dark subject matter is because of the fact that this is something that I truly believe needs to be talked about in the evangelical church, including <laughs> Um, something as difficult as the sexual abuse of children and more importantly the covering up of one man's sin by pastors who had reason to to show partiality and bias and instead of holding this man accountable in the churches for what he did they instead wishing to protect him they decided to cover up his sin and protect his ministry even when it was very clear when there was very clear evidence of the contrary so this is a topic uh sexual abuse pastoral abuse um the protection of men who have abused their authority and leadership this is something that doesn't necessarily always get talked about often it's certainly been getting talked about more in evangelicalism somewhat recently there's I'm, right now there's a lot of people talking about the scandal that's currently going on at grace community church with john macarthur and i'm hoping at some point to talk about that but oftentimes evangelicals or protestants you think of for example sexual abuse and that's often something that protestants would say goes on in roman catholicism and it certainly does and it's been very prevalent there with the the child abuse scandals of the pat that's come to light more and more in the past however many decades of uh, the end of the 20th century beginning of the 21st century but we some some christians evangelicals will mistakenly think that that does not go on in the same way in in evangelical churches or in Protestant churches or in conservative reformed churches and but we're learning more and more that that is just simply not the case and so over the past especially the past few months this wasn't something that I was ever intending to do but kind of being facing with some of this material and the Lord brought me to a place of after praying about this for some weeks and thinking about it and researching and really realizing that for even if you call yourself an evangelical or a conservative Protestant, this is a problem that's in our house, as it were. And it's something that we can't just ignore. It's something that we need to talk about. And I, I hope to talk about it in the right way. But it's something that I know many people would really hope to just sweep under the rug. But that's just going to bring great destruction upon God's church. And... I want to start today by by reading a passage of scripture from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1 verses 13 through 20. And turning to this Isaiah chapter 1 cuz this is talking about the need of not just giving vain going through the Israel was going through the ceremonies of worship vainly and hypocritically but they weren't purging evil from their midst and their therefore their worship was hypocritical and then ultimately displeasing to the lord and it really sums up this case of this comparison that can be made to some of these scandals in evangelicalism where we can talk about our theology and we can talk about worshiping god correctly and of course those are important things to discuss but if there's sin in our camp in our midst if we ignore those things but we simply instead just continue to focus on our quote our theology then our service to god becomes hypocritical and it brings down god's anger and displeasure and this verse these verses really sum it up 
So Isaiah chapter 1, verses 13 through 20 reads, Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me, I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear, your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Amen. So we see, as I said before, in these verses that Israel was offering their new moons and their Sabbaths and their worship unto God. But there was great evil in their midst. There was great hypocrisy. There was great iniquity in the land of Israel. And the Lord was saying, away with it. It's not that the Lord didn't care about the Sabbaths or the ceremonies or the worship that he had appointed under the Old Testament. He did care about these things. But these verses are pointing to the fact that when the hearts of men are not right and they're hiding great sin in their midst, all of the displays of worship, when those things are not dealt with, are actually hypocritical, they're vain, they're empty, and ultimately they're evil. And there's, there's great comparisons that can be made in the evangelical church. And even though many people may not want to hear it, it's something that we need to hear. And we look at there have been many great pastoral scandals in the church in modern times and there has been including abuse of minors and there's been cover-ups and those are things that we we do need to talk about and of course we need to talk about them in the right way and in the right spirit and carefully and in a way that's wise and good but we can't just ignore these problems and we can't just put them aside just because they are inconvenient truths and some great examples as I've done some research into this topic some great examples of some really large scandals that are going on or have gone on in recent times that have really um, yeah, really ravaged sections of evangelicalism one would be uh, CJ Mahaney that he was a really big figure in the Sovereign Grace Church movement that was part of the New Calvinist movement, very big in the 2000s, was partnered with men such as John Piper and others in that movement. And there was scandals that came out regarding the sexual abuse of minors and cover-ups. And obviously, as I mentioned before, right now there's a lot going on with Grace Community Church, John MacArthur, um, this woman, Aline Gray, um, I believe I got her name right, and the scandal regarding she was excommunicated from the church. The elders claimed that she uh, was abandoning her husband and being unsubmissive, and then it was found out later he went to j that husband. He did go to jail for abuse of his children, and these are the things that the woman brought forward and that those concerns were not heard by the elders and the elders have not renounced their posture on that at Grace Community Church. And that's something that is creating a lot of talk right now. And even one of the elders at the church there, Han Cho, has resigned due to this scandal. And I'm hoping to talk about that one more in depth. And then there's also this one that I'm going to talk about today with Tom Chantry. And the reason why I've chosen to do the one on Tom Chantry first is for a number of reasons. One, because it's, they're all very, very serious, not to be taken lightly. This one is very bad. It caused the entire dissolution of an entire association of churches known as ARBCA, and I'm going to talk about that more. 
So that's one reason why I've decided to talk about it too, because the facts of it are very, very well documented. And even though, for example, the one with John MacArthur, there's a lot of very credible information that's come out, but that one is still very much ongoing. And thirdly is because I historically come from a background of, I spent about between four or five years as a member of Reformed Baptist Church. And therefore, I have known about the scandal with Tom Chantry, and it's something that I heard about. The church that I was a member of was not an Arbica church. It was not directly involved in the Tom Chantry scandal. But when you're in the Reformed Baptist world, it's a small world. So it's something that I heard about. And I have talked to people who were acquainted with it. And therefore, that has given me personal motivation to think that this topic is the first one to, to tackle in talking about these situations of abuse and yeah, really sexual abuse in the church and also pastoral abuse of authority are some of the issues that are probably talked about the least in evangelical Protestantism. And it's something that should be talked about and addressed. So what I'm going to do for the rest of this video is I'm going to simply give a timeline of what happened. And then near the end of the video, I'm going to, draw out some lessons that can be learned from what happened here and ultimately just encouraging people to to know about this topic to be aware of it because i've even talked to people who are in reformed baptist churches or were even members of reformed baptist churches and they have not known about what happened with tom chantry and the cover-up and that's really amazing to me i was even talking to a pastor at one point and he was going to his church they were going to join an association that had nothing to do with ARPCA and I said to him I said well you know you know brother have you heard about what happened with this because this association your church might join it has nothing to do with this situation but do you know this history do you know the lessons of the warnings, the cautions that should come out from this. And he, and he said to me very honestly, very genuinely, no, I haven't heard about it. And I told him about it and he listened and he took those things into consideration and they, and that, that was a productive conversation. But that man was even a pastor of a church and that was, and it's just, he didn't know this history. So it needs to be brought forward. And that's, so I'm just going to walk through it and talk through it and then, try to pull out some lessons and hopefully that this information can be taken in and even though it's a difficult subject matter and it can be of help to Christians that would hold to the doctrines of grace or call themselves reformed or a part of conservative evangelical Protestant churches or reformed churches or reformed Baptist churches and that this can be information that can be used for the good of God's people. So all of that being said, I'm going to start by talking about what is the Reformed Baptist movement, the modern Reformed Baptist movement, and really going back to um, there have been Reformed Baptist is a term for Baptists that often hold to the doctrine of grace, what are called Calvinism. There's other theological distinctives that they hold. They see themselves in the particular Baptist tradition that goes through historically, such as the Baptists in the 17th century that wrote the first and the second London Baptist Confession of Faith or in history men such as Spurgeon, whatever. And after the 19th, the end of the 19th century, when theological liberalism was coming into the church and other theological trends such as dispensationalism were coming into the church, there was a drop. Um, by and large, in many sections of the evangelical world of Reformed theology. But then what happened was, in the second half of the 20th century, there was a resurgence of Reformed Baptist churches. There was a new modern movement that came about of churches that we would now know as Reformed Baptist churches. And there's a few things that contributed to this. Um, one of the things was the book publisher, Banner of Truth, they, they ended up republishing many book titles, such as many of the Puritan paperbacks. They brought forth a lot of older Puritan and Reformed books, and that led to a recovery in interest in Reformed theologies in many parts of evangelicalism, 
in Pado Baptist and in Credo Baptist circles, so that was certainly a contributing factor. But then there was also a number of men who came to hold to the doctrines of grace, and they came to study the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is a good, it's a very good confession of faith, theologically. And it, there was a movement in the second half of the 20th century that became the Reformed Baptist movement. And most Reformed Baptist churches today, they're going to hold to, theologically, they're going to hold to they're, they're usually known as Reformed Baptist churches, and they're usually known as 1689 Reformed Baptist churches because the 1689 Confession, the London Baptist Confession, is usually the confession that Reformed Baptist churches hold to. And they usually are amillennial in their eschatology, uh, and they're, many of the times they are, many, many of the pastors in the Reformed Baptist movement are critical texts. They'll usually use Bible translations such as the NASB. And they're usually, um, those are usually some of the distinctives. They hold to things such as the regulative principle of worship. They'll usually, they're Sabbatarians. They'll hold to the Sabbath. And those are usually some of the theological distinctives that define Reformed Baptists. So as the Reformed Baptist movement got going, there were really, one of the men that was really instrumental in starting and getting that movement going was a man by the name of Al Martin of Trinity Reformed Baptist Church in Montville, New Jersey. He was very influential and he still is to this day is a very influential pastor amongst the Reformed Baptists. And then the other group of men that were very influential in the Reformed Baptist movement were the leaders of what became ARBCA. And ARBCA is an acronym that stands for the Association of Reformed Baptist Churches of America, which at one point became a very large association of Reformed Baptist churches. And there was a split at one point amongst the amongst the ARBCA men and Al Martin over the issue of formal associations, where Al Martin took the view that having your church be a part of a formal association and the ARBCA association had an administration council over it, Al Martin took the view that that was unbiblical and he therefore didn't have his church be a part of a formal association and that led to division between him and the leaders of ARBCA. And I can say I do agree that formal associations are unbiblical. But, but then coming forward to the Association of Reformed Baptist Churches, one of the men that was very influential leader in the ARBCA movement was a man by the name of Walter Chantry who was a gifted pastor, who was a leader amongst the Reformed Baptist churches, who had a reputation as a godly man, and he was very prominent, and he was a leader, and he was somebody who was distinguished as a great pastor. <laughs> and his son, who we're going to talk about, was a man by the name of Tom Chantry. And Tom Chantry was known as the son of Walter Chantry. And so when he grew to be a man and he studied to be a pastor and he entered the ministry, he was moved very quickly into the ministry. And I believe his reputation of being the son of a prominent leader in the Reformed Baptist movement certainly influenced that, which was certainly a mistake to have a man be moved forward because of who his father was. That's certainly a mistake, to say the least. And that really brings us to the start of the story of... Tom Chantry. So the story of Tom Chantry and his abuse and the cover of it, cover up of it, it really goes as far back as 1995. So here we are in 2023. So that's almost 30 years ago. And really his trials, this story, it really goes up to even about 2020. So this went on for a long time and there's a lot of moving pieces and I, I can't I've studied this. I'm going to give a general timeline of it. I'm not claiming to hit every single detail of what happened. And I'm trying to speak about this in a way that's respectful to those who went through it. That is my intention. And once again, just trying to cover the events accurately to give people a picture of what happened. But there's a lot of information on the internet about this. There's a lot of people, both men and women, who have been very courageous in, in dedicating themselves to getting the information about this out there so people can know it because they want people to know it either people who went through it 
Um, they were part of churches that went through it. And there's a lot of information on it, but just trying to give a general timeline of what happened. So, so here we are, Tom Chantry in 1995. He came to this church called Miller Valley Baptist Church. And he was, he was brought there and really with the intention of moving him into the pastorate. And within a year of being there, he was ordained. So he, the church moved very, very quickly to move him into leadership. And you think of the Bible verse, lay hands suddenly on no man. I personally believe that a man should be a member of a local church before he's even considered to be a pastor of that same church. And if someone's going to be brought in, he should be brought in, come a member, and then over time be considered. But they clearly, they, this was a very accelerated process. And once again, there was his reputation of being the son of Walter Chantry. And when Tom Chantry was a man who was, he had a gift, um, maybe not, let me say it, he had an ability for oratory, and he was known as a good preacher, so that certainly helped him. But he came in June of um, 1995, and he was ordained in, by February 1996. So, so like within a year, he was ordained as a pastor at Miller Va Valley Baptist Church. And then let me just briefly state between 1990, between his coming in 1995 and 2000, a, reports of Tom Chantry molesting children happen. And I'm just going to, I don't want to speak too much about it too graphically, but he was tutoring children one on one. Multiple families had, they trusted him to do that. And there was spanking that was excessive to the point of being abusive or sadistic and there was a sexual element of as well with almost uh, inappropriate touching and grabbing etc and all of the horrible things associated with it and i'm not going to say any more but it was clearly sadistic and it was clearly sexual molestation and this happened with multiple people so that gives a picture of what it is and and I've, as what would happen, he did this. Victims were traumatized. Families found out. And as as that happened, it came to the attention of the pastors at the church, Miller Valley, and it came to the attention of the leadership of ARPCA. In ARPCA, as I said, they were a formal association of churches that held to the 1689. And they had this administrative council, which is supposed to not have any authority over the local church, but there was clearly this kind of leadership that was there and certainly an influence over the churches. And these were run by prominent pastors. So these reports, by 2000 at the latest, the administrative council of ARPCA was fully aware of the allegations of abuse. And the first thing that needs to be said is that they failed to report it to the authorities. So they did not follow the law of the land. And that's a righteous law that sexual, uh, allegations of sexual abuse should be reported to the authorities. And the churches do not have the right to just keep that quiet and keep it to themselves. So they violated Romans 13.1. And they appointed an informal council, a fact-finding team, as it were, to find out what's going on. And so this is about the year 2000 at this point. And the men who are a part of this, there's a man, pastor, these are all pastors. Rich Jensen, Mike McKnight, Ted Tripp, Don Lindbad. And so this fact-finding team and this informal council, they, they went to Miller Valley Baptist Church. They, they uh, brought their findings back. And essentially their report to the administration of Council of ARPCA and to Miller Valley Baptist Church, yeah, they did not recommend that, that Tom Chantry be 
removed from his ministry, despite the credibility of the allegations. And there was a letter that was sent out to the leadership of Miller Valley Baptist Church, some other people, to um, Walter Chantry, his father, was in on that letter, possible conflict of interest, um, the administrative council. And they did, and then what happened was, is this progress moved on, obviously very serious, credible claims brought forward. They were, Tom Chantry was encouraged to resign from the church. <laughs> and then instead of seriously addressing what had happened, there was these men in Arca, they went about having a highly biased program of bringing about, quote, restoration or reconciliation. And what they were essentially doing was they were going to great lengths to protect Tom Chantry's ministry and his reputation. Um, there's clearly bias, partiality, and even just outright, they just did not care about the truth. They cared about protecting their reputations and his reputation. And there was this culture of these pastors just look patting each other on the back and looking out for each other. And that was clearly extremely sinful and wrong. You even think of first Timothy chapter five, where it talks about rebuking pastors that have sinned. And Paul in that section of scripture is very clear, do nothing out of partiality or bias. Because Paul knows the temptation, and we need to be very very careful about bringing allegations toward an elder. But pastors do sin, and we see that in in First Timothy five, or we see that in Second John three. And some people are almost of the mindset that a pastor can never sin, and that's clearly unbiblical. And the New Testament clearly contradicts that. So it's very important for people to not be biased, but to see the truth as it really is, even when that's very difficult. And when people fall into the sin of partiality, that's exactly what it is. That partiality is a sin. And the book of James makes that very clear. And that when anybody, whether a pastor or not, is covering up for the sins of any man, whether a pastor or not, that is clearly sinful and wrong. And you have the blood of that man's sin on your hands because you're complicit in it. But moving forward here, so by 2002, Tom Chantry had went to a church called Providence Reformed Baptist Church in Washington. So he left Miller Valley Baptist Church in Arizona. He goes to Providence Reformed Baptist Church, and it is not long before he's regularly preaching again. And it was not long before he didn't, he went through some type of a, a counseling but it was not long before he was being recommended by the elders of that church to be brought back into ministry. So it, it was, he was removed for a time because of the scandal in Miller Valley and the safe face that had to be done, but it was not long before he was being pushed back forward into leadership and clearly a lack of integrity by many men involved. And then in 2004, he's working at a institution called Christian Liberty Academy and at there, there was, once again, he was around children and more incidents of molestation and abuse with the spanking and all the rest of it. And so it continued on. The problem was unaddressed. This goes back to 1995, 2006. And by 2004, it hasn't been handled. The problem has not been handled. And it just shows the great damage it comes when sin is not dealt with. And it is just when people turn a blind eye to sin and they ignore it because of who's committing it, it just wreaks havoc and it destroys churches. It destroys groups of churches or denominations. And it's just devastating. And, and it just, just, if you think of the compassion for the people who were hurt, more people were hurt because of the fact that this wasn't dealt with before. And that's tragic. And, yeah, it's messed up. But then by 2006, Tom Chantry became the pastor of a church called Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Wisconsin. So fast forwarding somewhat, things, these events and all the terrible things that went on in them, implications of it continue to unravel for really the next 
10 years or so. But now we're getting forward into like 2015, 2016. And at this point, ARBCA, knowing what's going on, knowing the, the charges, knowing even that he was being investigated criminally at this point, Tom Chantry, they accepted Tom Chantry's church because he became the pastor of this church in Wisconsin into ARBCA, knowingly. Knowing what happened, they brought his church into the association. And talking about ARBCA's cover-up, they had documents going back to their investigation at 2000. And some of these ARBCA pastors probably knew about it even a few years before, almost certainly, actually, based on credible research. And the point is, is that the leadership of ARBCA knew about it, and they actually had sealed documents. <laughs> the administrative council, the leadership of ARBCA, had documents that they kept sealed for years, and they knew about what was going on, and they covered it up. And but when, but then moving forward, Tom Chantry eventually got indicted and charged, and he was brought to trial two separate occasions. And the second time, he got convicted on all the counts and went to jail. Well, when that happened, more and more people in Arbka churches and Arbka leadership began to find out what was going on. And people were finding out not just about what Tom Chantry did, but they were finding out about the men who covered it up and their sins. And it eventually destroyed the association. And the association went from over 100 churches, I think, at its zenith to it shrunk down to less than a dozen, essentially. So there was a mat when many churches, when they found out what went on, there was a mass exodus out of the association. And amazingly, that association is still around, but they've changed their name to the Confessional Baptist Association. And, you, and people could really put forward the credible question of, should that association even still exist? But I digress. And it should be noted that there are certain people who got their churches out of Arbka out of principle, and then others who did it to save face. And there are people who courageously spoke up about what was going on and even called out the sins of their own pastors, the pastors who covered up. And then there are other people who turned a blind eye to sin and even took the people who were speaking up and vilified them and accused them and made them accuse them of being troublemakers in their churches. And there were church splits over this issue of Tom Chantry and the cover up. And there were exodus out of churches out of Arca. I talked to one individual. I talked to one individual in Arizona where he talked about how he went through. They went through a church split because they had because his pastor was a part of the sins, and that's amazing. So their churches got split up because of what happened. A whole movement got a movement of churches that held to many biblical truths. I think that's fair to say. And held to many things that were true. And there was some things that you say there would be good there. But the evil that went on took took the honor of the church and just smashed it through the mud. And it's disgusting. And it's horrible. And it's evil. And this is all because there's these men cared more about looking out for each other than about right and wrong. And they cared more about their positions of power and authority and their influences and and these networks of looking out for one another, those things were more important than their integrity. And it had great consequences. So this following up on this timeline at this point, by by 2016, Tom Chantry was indicted. And then in 2017, ARPCA, they gave a report to the General Assembly of the churches. When the, all the ARPCA churches that come together, they have what's called a General Assembly. You know, they have that yearly, annually. It was pretty much the biggest event on the calendar for ARPCA. And they knew about what was going on, and they stated to the churches there, they gave a report, and they said that they knew about the allegations going back to 2000 and they said that we initially addressed that but the more recent concerns that were continually coming out they said they had no knowledge of 
And in this, they knowingly lied, and that's been proven. They knowingly lied, and later that came out. And so, so then once again, by 2018, there was the first trial of Tom Chantry, and there was some counts of aggregated assault, and then the, the more serious charges of molestation. And he was found guilty on some of the counts of aggravated assault, and then on the more serious charges of molestation, there was a hung jury. So they weren't able to come to a consensus. And then there was the second trial where he was found guilty on all counts, and he was sentenced to 24 years. And his father-in-law, a man named, by the name of Al Huber, who was heavily involved in covering up for his son-in-law's crimes, pretty much bankrolled his son's legal defense. And that's from the church in Rockford, Illinois. And the church there had a big part in looking out for Tom Chantry. And in 2019, the sealed documents that I talked about with ARPCA, they got released. And a lot of things came to light for a lot of churches. And many ARPCA, many of the churches in ARPCA had greater awareness of what went on, what went on including these sealed documents. And that's what led to a mass exodus out of the Association of Churches. And it should be noticed that a lot of pastors, a lot of pastors in ARPCA knew what was going on. And a lot of Reformed Baptist pastors, even if their churches were not in ARPCA, knew what was going on for a long time. So, and there's a lot of men who claimed deniability, who knew about what was going on for a long time. There was a lot of looking the other way. There's a lot of, there was a lot of sin in regards to being complicit. Even to people who may not have been, quote, actively covering up. There are people who knew and decided to keep quiet and not look into it. And like I said, there were others, and I'm speaking very generally. There were people who did speak up and were willing to pay a price and take a stand for what was right. But there were many others who didn't. And as these things all unraveled, um, as these things all unraveled, it led to... Once again, the dissolution of ARPCA, there were church splits. It's a lot of ugly things that went on. And then in 2022, um, Arizona Court of Appeals, they there was a procedural issue with the improper use of evidence for Tom Chantry. His conviction got overturned. Um, I think it's the legal term is without prejudice, which meant that the prosecution had the right to retry him yet again, it would have meant a third trial. And one of the key witnesses said that just couldn't go through it again. So therefore the prosecution didn't bring a third trial and Tom Chantry was released. And I'm going to say unequivocally at this point, just because of that appeal and him getting out of prison, there's not a shred of doubt that the man's guilty. And there are even some who may be still arrogant, even to this day, to try to claim that he didn't that he didn't do it. And that's a disrespectful to the families. That's disrespectful to what happened. The evidence is overwhelming. And and the Lord knows. But but yeah, that's the story of what happened. And it's it's a dark, it's a it's a troubling story. It's a difficult story. And there's a lot of things, there's a lot of lessons that can be pulled from this for the church to be better off and the church to learn from this and to not let these same type of things hopefully happen again. And, and the, uh, the biggest thing in this is that the importance of integrity amongst members of churches and pastors of churches, those in leadership, it's crucial. It's absolutely crucial. You can talk about your ecclesiology all day long, and that's important. It's really important. You talk about your theology all day long, your sound doctrine. And once again, yes, it is really important. If there's not godly character in integrity, things are going to fall apart no matter what. There has to be integrity. There has to be character. There has to be what the Bible calls godliness. There has to be godliness, and especially amongst the pastors, because when that's not there, things get get difficult and ugly really, really quickly. 
So talking about some of these things that we can pull away from this. One, we can see that the sins of lying, deceit, partiality, covering up are deadly. And these are sins that the Lord hates. He hates lying lips. He hates deceit. He hates partiality. And these pastors lied for Tom Chantry. They covered up for Tom Chantry. They showed partiality in favor of Tom Chantry. And one of the biggest things, he was a pastor. He was a prominent pastor. And he was the son of a prominent pastor. And all of these things contributed to these men not wanting to deal with that sin. And that's of, of pastors across multiple churches. And this was widespread. And one of the things I didn't mention, there were multiple people who covered this and reported this over the years. And there was one man, for example, by the name of Brett Detweiler. And he started covering the issue of Tom Chantry. And when you go onto his website, he's talked about C.J. Mahaney, which was, he was a part of that Sovereign Grace movement. He talks about John MacArthur. He talks about Tom Chantry. And I think the vast majority of his articles are very good. I don't agree with every individual statement of every article he's ever written, but I believe the man has demonstrated sincerity and integrity in his reporting. And I think there's a lot of good in his articles. And he, for example, is early in 2016. So this is going back some years. This is before those sealed docs came out. He sent a letter to, he sent two different letters to every ARBCA pastor asking them to please investigate the issue of Tom Chantry without bias or partiality and to deal it and to address it. And he has an article with his two letters, the bodies of those letters posted on his website. And this was sent to some of the most prominent Reformed Baptist men in, in the world. Prominent theologians or leaders, men who teach in seminaries, you know, men such as Sam Waldron, Richard Barcellus, Fred Malone, part of prominent ministries. And he, he said that he got one response from a pastor named Chuck Rennie, who's told him there's nothing here for you to expose. And he said, and Brett Detweiler said that there's, that he essentially didn't get any reply from any of the other men. And what those men knew about what and why they decided to respond or not respond. And Brett Detweiler, he's just one example of this. Where all these individual men in the association, what they knew, what they didn't know, what God had on their conscience, the Lord knows. I'm not going to speak into specifics of beyond that, you know. And then other men who covered up, you know, David Dykstra, John Giorizzo, Earl Blackwood, Don Lindbad, Larry Vincent. All of these guys, part of cover-ups. Why did this happen? Big reason, partiality. Partiality. This man was a pastor. He was prominent, son of a prominent guy. They covered up. And it doesn't mean every ARBCA pastor is necessarily guilty of covering up. But a lot of men knew a lot for a long time. And a lot of them didn't take action early enough. And a lot of them didn't take action at all. And there's still a lot of men who have never repented of their sins of cover-up or of partiality of turning a blind eye. And that's a big problem. And it just brings so many lessons that, and I'm not, guys, I'm not trying to disrespect pastors. I'm not trying to tell you to be rebellious to your leaders. If you got a godly good man who's trying to be faithful to your soul, I'm not trying to get you to just overturn him, undermine him, not be submissive in the biblical way. But when things are getting to the point where sexual abuse in churches is getting covered up, it's a major problem. And, and there comes a point where pastors, the Bible says they should be respected, they should be honored, um, they should be loved by their congregation. But you know what? Pastors aren't infallible, and pastors sin. And even though we should love them and we should pray for them, I believe you should, we should pray for our pastors every day, wherever or whatever church we're, we're at. But, you know, it doesn't mean they can't sin, and it doesn't mean they can't be addressed. And when you're in that type of leadership and you're in a network of, of pastors and men, there's, there's temptations there. 
And partiality is a big one. And when you let the sin of one man go, and then it becomes, there's a temptation, it becomes three men's sin, and then five men's sin, and then ten men's sin. And next thing you know, you have an entire movement of churches in scandal. You think of what Paul said. In, <laughs> he's talking 1 Corinthians 5. There's a man who committed fornication. And the church was puffed up. They didn't want to deal with it. They didn't want to put the man out. For whatever reason, they had their motivations to not want to remove that man from the membership of their church and excommunicate him. And Paul says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. He's saying that sin and that evil will spread until it consumes the church. It's like gangrene. If you don't cut sin out of a church or you don't, you don't, rebuke men who've sinned or separate from sin or what, however the Lord's calling you to address it, the evil just spreads and spreads until it consumes everything in its wake. And that's what happened with Tom Chantry. And that's a lesson for us. That's a lesson for the church that we have to be willing to deal with sin. And sometimes we have to have the courageous, the courage to call out men who have sinned, even if they're powerful and they're influential. And even if they're in leadership, there's a right and a wrong way to do that. But there's times where it has to be done. And, but moving forward, saying once again, lies, deceit, partiality, big lesson. And I just said it before, letting sin remain unaddressed, it'll wreak havoc. It just, it will just destroy. And then the next point, and this is more theological. And as I said before, the greatest thing that we need is integrity amongst men. But there's a theological lesson here, and formal associations are unbiblical with an administration of council. And I challenge anybody, show me one verse where there's an administration of council over local churches. And I know if you study the history of ARPCA, they say they didn't have any actual authority over the churches. I'm well aware of that, that they were, and that the only thing they could do is disassociate people from a church, from their association. They had no authority doesn't change the fact administrative council formal associations there's no mention of it in the new testament i challenge anybody to show me where it is yes churches fellowship together and they help each other and they support one another but that's all local church to local church there's yeah you could say that churches quote associate together but there's no formal associations it's unbiblical and you see how that administrative council getting involved was detrimental. And yeah, I mean, theoretically, if you had had a bunch of men who had more integrity get involved, could God have used it for a better outcome? Yeah, sure. I mean, the Lord can do whatever he wants, but it doesn't change the fact that that administrative council was unbiblical and it was detrimental. There's just no getting around it. And then the next point is that this is going back to what I read in Isaiah chapter 1. It's that pride and hypocrisy, it truly does, and I don't mean to be harsh here, but it brings down the wrath of God upon individual men, and it brings down the wrath of God on churches or even groups of churches. And there was a lot of pride and hypocrisy amongst those men who covered up, and Tom Chantry. Clearly a very proud, egotistical man. Even hear how he kind of called down the wrath of God in one of those court, when he got convicted, I think the second time in the courtroom, he said the ego on the man is insane, absolutely insane. And the ego of those men who thought they could keep this under wraps, is, it's, 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 it's truly insane. And that's what pride does. Because when we don't be humble, and we don't have integrity to let anybody speak into our lives anymore. We we get to the point, and when we're so hypocritical that we're pretending to be so spiritual, and we can talk about how much we know the Bible, and we talk about how we think we know it all, but we're hypocrites, we become like the Pharisees. And when you see what the New Testament called the Pharisees, what John the Baptist said about the Pharisees, what all of the woes to you in Matthew 23, all the things that Christ said, you know, they're, they were vipers, <laughs> they're children of hell, they're just, they're bound for iniquity, whited sepulchers. When we let 
hypocrisy and pride reign over us. That's what we become. And there's a lot of men who were Pharisees in this, and that's wrong. And that's to say the least. And it truly brings down God's judgment upon churches when that happens. And that's what Isaiah 1's talking about. When the people of God are sincere and they're truly serving the Lord and the integrity of the heart, the Lord blesses that. But when we're going through the motions of our worship or going through the motions of talking about what we think the Bible says or our theology and our hearts aren't right and we don't have the integrity and the humility to address sin when it comes in, it brings down it brings down God's displeasure and it will just, it destroys. And I think a big reason why there's so much havoc in evangelicalism is because there's just been so much hypocrisy and such a lack of integrity, not in every church, but in so many prominent sectors of evangelicalism. And then the last thing I'll say is the point of talking to this point of cover up. There is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. And I'm going to read that verse. It's in Luke chapter 8, verse 17. And once again, it just goes back to these guys. Did they think they could get away with covering it up? Maybe some of them did. Obviously, they tried hard to do it. But you know what? There's nothing that's going to be that's not going to be revealed, whether in this life or in the next or at Judgment Day. <laughs> At the end of history, there's going to be a judgment. But let me read this. Luke 8, 8, 17. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither, neither anything hid that shall not be made known and come abroad. And that's it's just that principle that we reap what we sow. And I'm speaking once again to this cover-up. It's just pride. It's pride when we think that we're going to get away with something like that. And there's pro so much pride when we think that we could really... <laughs> These men were willing to step over the people that came out and spoke up and to villainize. Many people got villainized for speaking up. They got villainized. They got turned into the enemies of the people who were perhaps once their pastors. For saying to these men, looking them in the eyes and saying, you are the man. Like what Nathan said to David. And it just shows that there's something terribly wrong in evangelicalism. And some of these men were frankly wolves. They were wolves in sheep's clothing. They were pretenders. They were fakes. They were phonies. And many of them have been exposed. And But, you know, we need to have the discernment to know that just because someone's a pastor doesn't mean they're righteous. <laughs> you know, praise God for the godly pastors that are out there. Praise God for the men who do stick up for what's right and care about their sheep and have soft hearts and try by the grace of God to just stay true to God's word and try to do the best to be sincere. But some of these men just tried to take advantage of people. They tried to use people and they were going to do whatever they could to cover up the sins of those who they were looking out for, Tom Chantry, and looking out for themselves. And God sees all that. And a man, I, this is going back to what I said, not, there's nothing hidden that's not going to be revealed. You can think you can get away with it. And, you know, and maybe this life you will. Not every, not every wrong in this life is going to get righted. But as Christians, we have hope. There's a final judgment that's going to come, and God's going to set everything right at the end of history. And when you think you, you're going to, when, when men are doing that, they have no fear of God. They don't fear God. They don't, they don't remember that God is watching them. And this is something for all of us. This is something we need to preach to all of our hearts. We need to remember that what we reap, we will sow. And when we're doing evil unto others and we're only caring about advancing ourselves and our self-interest, God sees it. And we, have, we need to have a godly, holy fear of God. Because when you don't, this is the damage that can be done. And I know, guys, I know this is a tough, this is a tough subject. It's a dark subject matter. But I just feel in my spirit and in my soul 
that this is something that we just, we got to be willing to talk about the tough things. Because if we can't deal, as evangelical Protestants, and I know there's so much chaos in evangelicalism, and there's so many issues, and we can talk about how we should define the parameters of, you know, where is the church right now? But when we can't deal with the problems in our own house, how are we supposed to be a light to the world? And that's really what the Lord's put on my heart. When we can't address the issues in our own house and the world sees that hypocrisy, it destroys our witness. And also when, when we see the sheep scattered because of the harm of this, we have two choices. We can be selfish and just, if it's, we could say, well, it's not affecting us. So let's just not talk about it. And oftentimes that's easier because there can be a price for talking about these controversial topics. Or we can say, you know what? We got to buckle down and we got to stand up for what's right and not just looking out for our own interests, but we got to look out for our brothers or our sisters in Christ. And, and remember that just because a problem isn't directly affecting us doesn't mean that in a sense it's not our problem. And when you're talking about the abuse of kids, for the abuse of leadership. When you're talking about the honor of Christ's church and we're claiming to be servants of the king, it is our problem. And it's something that, the truth is, guys, there was a big part of me that didn't want to make this video because it's such a tough subject. But the Lord brought me to a place saying, not just this scandal, I'm hoping to do some other videos on this. We got to talk about it. We got to be willing to face the music of what's going on in the evangelical church. And... The encouragement is God's merciful, and he's gracious, and he's good. And when we're, if we're truly children of Christ, he loves us. And there's a better life to come, and we live in a sinful, fallen, evil world where if you walk, if you walk through, you try to walk in your integrity, you're going to face disappointments and hardships and betrayals. But Christ is there with us, and he's faithful. So there's encouragement. But we got to be able to talk about the tough stuff. We have to be able deal with the issues that are prevalent. And the only way we can do that is if we're willing to stand up, be courageous, and talk about what's right and stand up for what's right. Because if we don't do that, then all our claims of being a light to the world is all just bogus. It's fake. And we're at a time where we need sincere Christians that are going to be real and not be fake. And so that's why I decided to make this video. So last thing I'll say, you know, for everybody who went through that, if they're watching this video, just know you have, I have a lot of compassion in my heart toward the victims that went through this. I've even tried the past few weeks as I researched just to pray for them. I think we got to remember compassion and we got to remember, you know, if there are people who have, if, you've, if you're watching this video and you're somebody who you were a part of that cover-up, you need to repent. You need to, If you were a part of that cover-up and that complicity or turning a blind eye, you've sinned against the Lord and you've sinned against others and you got to go repent and you got to make it right and your repentance has to be as public as your sin was. That's the principle. And you have to show fruits of repentance that you are sincere and that you're not talking out of both sides of your mouth. And for the pastors that turned a blind eye to this, especially <laughs> just because you might have not got thrown out of your church it didn't, doesn't mean you didn't sin if you covered this up. And you got to repent because the Lord sees it and the Lord knows. And if you know, if you're in a situation where you're in communion with people that committed these sins, and you know that, you got to go to them, you got to call out the sin, and if they don't hear you, you got to separate. You go through Matthew 18, if that doesn't work, you got to separate. Biblical separation, that's what, because people turning a blind eye is the biggest reason why this happened. And so... And the last thing I'll say is with these, with this issue and with these other issues of abuse, we got to pray about them. We got to remember to pray for them. There's spiritual warfare in this stuff. Things this dark don't come into the church by accident. Satan's working in them, and we got to pray. And so, all that being said, 
I know this is a hard subject, guys, but it's important. And it's important that we talk about this. We talk about some of these other scandals. And if we are willing to address the sins in our churches, God may just heal our land. And God, regardless of what happens in the wider world, if we have the humility to address these problems, God will honor it and he'll see it. And God is merciful. And I believe a big reason why there's so many so much chaos and havoc in evangelicalism right now is because there's unaddressed sin in our churches and in our leadership of our churches. And this issue of an association of churches dissolving because of these type of sins, it's a great example of what I'm talking about. But if we deal with this stuff by the grace of God, he'll be merciful and he's going to help us and the church will be better off for it. So as I just, guys, I just say, just know about what happened here, pray about it, be aware of it, and just and just ask the Lord how what to do with this information. And God's going to use that for the building of his kingdom and for his glory. So all this being said, this is Joe Harper with Reformed Truth and Ministries. God bless. <laughs>